All right, why don't we get started? So thank you guys very much for joining. I'm Mark LaMonica. Look after the individual investor team for Morningstar here in Sydney. Today we're going to talk about income investing and income investing with ETFs, which I think is an interesting topic. So hopefully you all will think so as well. First couple of housekeeping items, anything you hear today is general advice. I don't know anything about you. So I, of course, can't offer personal advice. If you're in New Zealand, you can get a copy of our VAP from our website, morningstar.com.au. And the New Zealand regulatory authorities would encourage you to talk to a financial advisor for personal advice. All right. As I said, we're going to talk a little bit about income investing using ETFs today. So, of course, this will be recorded, should be on our website by Friday. Um, if you have any questions, shoot them through during the presentation, either in the chat or in the Q&A, and we will, I will get to them. All right, so we're going to start this thing where we normally start these things, and we're thinking about what you're actually trying to accomplish. So my guess is if you're tuning in today, perhaps you are looking to implement a income investing strategy. We know that is something that a lot of people are very interested in. And there are typically two types of goals that people are trying to get out of an income investing strategy. So the first goal is trying to create, as you can read on the screen, a predictable and growing income stream that you either currently use or will use to pay for your life. So we particularly see this with a lot of people that are either trying to retire early or have retired early or are, of course, in the retirement phase of their life. And they're trying to fund that through income. So there are a couple of implications out of this. And I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago on income investing. And I heard from a lot of people that were using this strategy. A lot of people before retirement, pre-retirement, before their preservation age. So this is a very popular one. There's another side of this, and this is, of course, using an income strategy to try to accomplish a couple things with your portfolio, not necessarily totally reliant on that income, but looking to lower the volatility or how much your portfolio bounces around in value and outperform the market. So there is some evidence, which we'll talk about, and some academic research that says that investing in income-producing assets can do just that. So talk about that and both these strategies, and some people may use both, so these are not mutually exclusive, but there are certain implications from both of these strategies, especially when we talk, start talking about ETFs. So ETFs, of course, are simply an investment vehicle that hold a basket of, could be anything, shares, bonds, etc. But there are some particular attributes of ETFs that can be a little bit tricky when people are trying to use it for an income investing strategy. So that's what we will talk about today. But let's talk about these strategies again. So let's say you are trying to create a predictable and growing income stream. So many people, of course, have a goal or have accomplished the goal of trying to create a portfolio that actually funds you, funds your life or whatever else you're trying to pay for out of it, just using income. And this can be very attractive. And it, become, and it can be very attractive because one of the things we certainly worry about as investors, particularly in retirement or in early retirement, is making sure that the amount of money you've accumulated does not go away before you pass away, right? So that's one of the problems with retirement is none of us know how long it's going to last. So generally, what we talk about is managing this through withdrawal rate, so making sure you are not taking too much out of your portfolio every year to ensure it will last for your lifetime. But because of the unpredictability around that, many investors think, okay, well, if my portfolio can generate enough income for me to live off of, then that is a great solution to that problem of not knowing when any of us will die. And this can be tricky because it does involve amassing a large amount of money potentially a amount of money that many people would find very challenging to um, save and, uh, and invest. But 
this is very attractive for that reason. So that's that first strategy. Now, what are you trying to accomplish here? Well, if you're paying for your life using the income generated from your portfolio, what you're really thinking about is the volatility of that income stream. So you are less worried about the volatility of your underlying portfolio, because once again, you are living off of the income generated. But you are pretty concerned about the volatility of that income, because of course, that's paying for your life. And just like when many of us are working, as I am right now, you wouldn't want your paycheck to bounce around every time you got it, because that's going to be very difficult with budgeting and figuring out what you can actually spend, you really don't want that income to bounce around a lot year to year either, because of course it presents that same problem to you. So we're going to look at income investing using ETFs, using this as one of the lenses. The other lens we're going to look at is if we are simply using the strategy, as I said, not necessarily to live off of the income from a portfolio, but because we believe that picking income producing assets will do good things for us, things we want to accomplish. And that can be lowering the volatility of the portfolio. So we're talking about the amount of money you have at this point instead of your income. And because we want to outperform the market. And there's been, as I said, several studies out there that have looked at what is the impact, particularly around shares of buying income producing shares, what impact can that have on your portfolio? And one of the famous studies was one that was done by Merrill Lynch. And I've outlined a couple of points from that Merrill Lynch study. Um, and basically talking about the benefits of investing in income paying shares. So number one, obviously the ability to pay a dividend is going to say certain things about the company and certain things about the company that may be attractive for people. It can show that the company is stable and in good financial health because of course a dividend is a choice. A company decides whether they want to pay a dividend. So it's confidence that management and the board has in the company's prospects going forward that they're going to pay you that dividend as the owner of the company rather than squirrel away the cash. And it has other things to say about the company is generally these are larger, more stable companies because of that. And that can lower volatility so that when we're going through economic difficult or difficult economic times, then that company will, of course, be able to survive and be able to continue to last as a company, as I said, survive, but also will continue to grow and prosper into the future. So it is a positive sign around the company, number one. So just think about the different investment opportunities and what dividend payers represent. It is also a very large part of the total return you receive. And one that I think we lose sight of a lot when we are in really, really speculative markets. So think some of the stuff that we saw post-COVID, where we saw a lot of small, more speculative companies in new and emerging spaces do very, very well and outperform some of the larger, more established companies. Now, we've seen that, of course, rolled back during last year. Um, but remember that over time and over a long time period, dividends do contribute a lot to returns. So it's varied across different decades, but upwards of 60% of returns during some decades is, uh, is attributable to dividends. And this is particularly true in Australia. So we have to understand that because of the tax system in Australia, investors have a large preference for dividends because of franking credits, because of that elimination of the double taxation of dividends. And because of that, Australian investors have naturally gravitated towards dividend paying shares. And of course, companies pay higher dividends. So we see higher payout rates in Australia or the amount of earnings that are paid out in dividends because of course, companies are catering to those investor preferences. So this is particularly true and this study looks back at the US, but this is even more true in Australia. And we also, of course, talk about dividend reinvestment, um, which, is a, uh, which is a way to kind of turbocharge those returns, potentially. What has this led to? Well, Merrill Lynch looked back between 1990 and 2018. They looked at the S&P 500, and there are a couple of caveats to this, which I'll add at the end. But they looked at the S&P 500, and they looked at something called a dividend aristocrat. So a dividend aristocrat is a company in the S&P 500, as you can 
read that had increased dividends for the past 25 years. And we can see that being able to identify those companies resulted in higher annual returns than you got from the overall index and actually lower volatility. So it bounced around less in price. Now, investing theory tells us that this shouldn't happen. We should get more volatility for higher returns. That's the price we pay as investors. But the study points out that in this case, that is not actually true. So we're getting the best of both poss- of all possible worlds. We are getting higher returns and we are getting lower volatility. So a very good thing. The only caveat that I'll point out here is that of course, when we are identifying these dividend aristocrats, we are looking backwards. Right? So we we're looking backwards and finding the companies that have raised their dividends 25 years in a row. And that, of course, can be very challenging for us to identify as investors going, as investors going forward. The other thing that I point out here is that there, and we'll talk a lot about yields. So right, a yield is how much, based on the price and the dividend level, the percentage that that company is paying out at any given time see that there's nothing in this dividend aristocrats um, definition that has anything to do with yields. So these are not necessarily high dividend payers. They are companies that have increased their dividends, but that doesn't mean that they have a higher yield than the overall market. It doesn't mean that you are getting a meaningful amount from dividends in any in any of this, just the fact that they've continually increased them over time. Now, that can be a very good thing for you as an investor regardless, because there's a trade-off in income investing between, of course, growth of that dividend and the yield that you get on that share. So I talked about payout ratios for a second there, right? So a payout ratio is how much of the earnings are paid paid out in dividends to investors. And that can be a very good thing, but also realize that there are other uses for that cash. And it's a little bit um, of a balance that companies need to um, set between the two. Because of course, if you have less cash to invest in the business, it doesn't grow as fast, potentially. So just a little bit of a caveat to this study. But once again, this does show that this is a strategy that at least has a track record of outperforming the market. So that's the other, once I said these are not mutually exclusive, that's the other strategy that people, and the other reason why people gravitate to dividends if they think they can get higher returns. Now, we're going to talk about ETFs, of course. So as I said, an ETF is an investment vehicle that holds a basket of shares, but there are certain tax implications related to ETFs and or certain tax laws that govern ETFs. And basically what an ETF is, is something that we refer to as a pass-through entity. So that means as the owner of that ETF, anything that's happening with that portfolio within the ETF is passed on to you if it's a taxable event. So that is income and that is capital gain. So this is the difference between dividends and distributions. So even though the words are exchanged a lot in investors, when investors speak about this and probably a little bit confused in their minds, let's look at the difference. So a dividend, as we said, is a cash payment made out of profits generated by a company to the owners of the company. And that's, of course, you as a shareholder. A distribution is what is paid out from an ETF. And a distribution consists of income. So what are all those shares generating in income? It's an equity ETF. So what are the dividends that those shares are paying out? But it's also capital gains. And so capital gains, of course, occur when you sell something for more than you bought it for. So whether that's you individually doing that or whether that is the ETF that is doing that. So those stem from changes in portfolios. And there's a couple different reasons why portfolios, why an ETF portfolio can generate a capital gain. So the first reason is of course, any sort of changes to an index if you are a passive ETF. So we're talking about different types of ETFs now. So if you are a passive ETF, you are investing in the ASX 200, and that represents the 200 biggest shares in Australia. Well, if the 201st share 
goes into the ASX 200 and the 200 drops out, that's a change in the index. And the trackers of that index, so the portfolio managers for that ETF, will have to make that swap. They will have to now include that 201st biggest share in the index. And potentially that could be a capital gains event, right? Because you are selling something and that could have appreciated in value and then you're buying something else. So that could generate capital gains. Now, in general, these are not huge sources of capital gains. So these broad based index tracking ETFs in general don't exhibit those capital gains for a couple different reasons. One, indexes do change. So that does happen, but many of these indexes that are tracking these broad based indexes like the ASX 200, they are market capitalization weighted indexes. So all that means is that the allocation into those 200 companies, if we're talking about the ASX 200, more goes into the bigger ones than the smaller ones. In fact, so much more goes into the bigger ones, and this is based on relative size of the company, but in general, so much more goes into the bigger ones that those positions around the edges, around the end of that ETF, are very small. And the example, of course, we can look right to Australia for that example. If we take an index like the ASX 200 or the ASX 300, you know, north of 10% of that is in one company at BHP, right? And then when we talk about the other very large companies in Australia, whether it's the big four banks, whether it's CSL, et cetera, they're taking up a large part of that index. So that means those positions are generally very small right around the edges. So that is an index ETF. There are also actively managed ETFs, an actively managed ETF, which is based on what a portfolio manager will decide. They'll decide what to buy and sell. They can, of course, also exhibit capital gains because that is the decision of the manager. And depending upon the manager's choices, those capital gains can be very large or they can be very small. But then we kind of have this third category of ETFs. And these ETFs are something different. So they can be either a thematic ETF, they could be a factor ETF, basically anything else that's governing what goes into that index. Now, there's a couple things that you need to consider about these. So number one, and we'll talk about this more, number one, you have to understand what that ETF, what is the decision-making behind what goes into that ETF. Now, many of these say they are, or at least imply they are passive, and they may track an index, but that index may have lots of rules. So it's not one of these broad-based indexes we always hear about. That index can have a lot of rules in it. Or for a pure factor ETF, where they are trying to identify securities that meet certain criteria, there can be very set rules around what goes into that portfolio and what doesn't. And there can be very set rules around rebalancing. So rebalancing, of course, if we do that as investors in our own portfolio, what that means is we are trying to, that our portfolio is deviated to some sort of set, from some sort of set percentage, and we are trying to get it back into where we want it. So rebalancing can occur, and we'll use an example of this, rebalancing can occur on a quarterly basis, it could occur semi-annually, it could recur annually, but depending upon those rules, we need to figure out, okay, what is the impact going to be on the portfolio and will that generate capital gains? I'll talk a little bit about why this is important and we'll use some examples, but just remember all those different types of events that could cause a capital gain, which will add to that distribution that gets distributed to you. We're going to use an example and we'll talk about some of the pitfalls. So I talk about this all the time. Um, so people are probably sick of me talking about this stupid ETF, but it is a really easy example because it does have very few holdings in it. So we're talking about the FANG ETF, the Global X FANG ETF. So ticker symbol FANG. So what this is supposed to do is it's supposed to follow um, companies that are FANG-like. So when we talk about FANG, we're talking about Facebook and Apple. And Alphabet, which is Google, um, and really it's supposed to denote um, and Amazon, um, Netflix, 
sorry, go through all the little uh, letters in here, even though they've two of these companies have changed their name now. What this is supposed to really denote is kind of cutting edge technology companies. So the FANG ETF tracks something called the FANG index. Now the FANG index is called an index. It's not an index. There's a committee of people that picks the companies that go into there. And it only has 10 holdings, which is why I like to use it as an example, because it's very easy for us to look at. So I went on to Yahoo Finance right up here, and I took a little screenshot of this FANG ETF. And it says yield 5.60%. Now, many people probably look at that and say, wow, that is great. So to go out there and find an ETF that holds shares that has a 5.6% yield is a pretty great thing, right? So I think a lot of us would jump at that opportunity. And this is the pitfall, and this is going to be illustrative of that pitfall that we run into if we don't understand the difference between a dividend and a distribution. So this, of course, is an ETF. It is paying distribution. So we can go look at the underlying holdings. And here they are. As I said, 10 different shares are in this ETF. And when this thing is rebalanced, and it's rebalanced quarterly, it rebalances back to 10% into each one of these shares. So this is basically an equal weighted index. Index is that term loosely, this is an equal weighted product that has 10 different shares in it that will be rebalanced quarterly to get it back into 10% in each one of these um, holdings. Now, interestingly enough, this is easy to do with this particular ETF. We can go look at the yield of the underlying holdings. And what do you see here? Well, you're not seeing a lot of dividends. Oh, I don't know why things are beeping. But they are. Anyway, sorry about that. So we can go and look at the yield of these underlying holdings that are actually in here. Remember, an ETF is nothing more than what is held in it. And as you can see, seven out of 10 of these holdings pay zero dividends. So they have decided not to pay a dividend. They, once again, are trying to capture these sort of, you know, future techie companies in here. A lot of those companies don't pay dividends because they're still trying to grow a lot. Just make them good doesn't make them bad, but once again, seven out of 10 don't pay dividends. You'll also see that the ones that do pay dividends don't pay very high dividends. So the only one that's yielding more than 1% currently is Microsoft, barely over 1%. So how does this math add up? How do we hold 10 securities, none of them really paying a high dividend, yet get a 5.6% yield? Well, the simple answer is, of course, what comes out in that distribution is capital gains. Because this thing is rebalanced quarterly, and remember, to try to keep things aligned with that 10% in each holding, what happens when it's rebalanced? The winners, or the shares that on a relative basis have done really well, are sold. And the money goes into the shares on a relative basis that have not done as well. And that's what keeps it balanced. So all of this yield that you are getting is from capital gains. So if I go in there and look at our website, where we do not quote the yield of an ETF because it is misleading, and we go and look at the underlying portfolio, what's the dividend yield? 0.17%. So very, very low, which is expected given the yield of the underlying holdings. All right, so this is a simple example with 10. I was looking at an ETF that had 200. Be more at least time consuming for me to go through and look at every single one of those holdings. That's why I'm using this. So what is the problem with this? Well, the problem with this is that if you are going to go back and look at ETFs with high yields and try to invest from an income perspective, you could be in trouble if you're just looking at that past yield because it's looking at that distribution, it's looking at capital gains that are generated out of it, not just dividends. And the problem with this is, is if we go back and we look at those two reasons why people pursue income investing strategy, the first reason is that you want a predictable income because you want to pay for your life. Well, this is going to be anything but predictable. So why did we see 
so many capital gains last year get distributed? Well, the reason is because a lot of these shares had appreciated a lot. They had run up tremendously in the years before. That was reflected in those quarterly rebalances, and you're getting capital gains paid out to you. Now, what happens if we have a prolonged bear market, particularly around these names, which incidentally we have seen? So we saw very poor performance in a lot of these names in 2022. What happens? Well, that yield will disappear. So that distribution will shrink significantly. And it'll shrink significantly because in those rebalancing events that happen, if they are selling shares for less than they paid for them, there is no capital gain. So that yield that many investors are expecting to get will disappear. So the very simple lesson here is obviously understand what's in your portfolio and understand what's in an ETF. So the couple of things we want to look out for, and we'll go into this more, is what are the underlying holdings yielding? Because that is going to give you more predictability into what will be paid out in the distribution going forward. And also understand the portfolio construction process in this ETF. It plainly says everywhere you look around this FANG ETF that it's rebalanced quarterly. Think about those implications. So we can have very large scale changes in this portfolio over the course of the year as we go through four of those rebalancing, not to mention the fact that this is basically actively managed because there's a committee that chooses these 10 chairs. And at any time, they could choose to buy five more of them and replace five of them in here. So this is an ETF that, for example, has a very, very high likelihood of generating capital gains in an upper market. The other reason that we talked about why you invest for income is because you believe that income producing shares have certain attributes that will benefit your portfolio, that lowering the volatility and that outperformance. Well, in this case, if you once again looked at the yield of this ETF, assumed that that meant it held a bunch of companies that had high yields, you were also not getting what you're looking for, right? Because only three out of 10 pay dividends, none of them very high. That can be another issue for you. So this is really the sort of yield trap that we run into. Um, that we run into with uh, with ETFs potentially, and it's why it's important to understand what's in the ETF. The only other thing I would say is, you know, some people question this, and they'll say, "Well, who cares? I'm still getting this money," and you are. You are getting a cash payment in Australia. There is no difference between how the ATO classifies a dividend and capital gains, you're basically paying the same tax on it. Now, these are all foreign holdings. There is no franking credits distributed, so I'm just taking that off the table. But just from a marginal tax rate perspective that you're going to pay on capital gains versus dividends, you are going to be taxed the same. So whether that's held in super or not held in super. So many people say, who cares? I'm still getting this payment. And this is an actual payment. So these capital gains are distributed to you in a payment. Um, it's, not just, uh, it's not just them flowing through in your taxes without getting anything for it. But the problem, once again, and what I encourage people to do is align your goals and what you're trying to accomplish out of this portfolio with what's actually happening. So if you're trying to live off of this, and last year you got 5.6%, and it was even higher in years before. Well, think about what you're going to get now. It's probably not going to be as much this year. I'd be willing to bet it's not going to be as much this year unless something crazy happens with markets. So that can really impact, of course, your ability to fund your life. All right, I'm going to pause for a couple questions. Um, let's see what we have here. Um, so we've got a question from Rodney, who I always say should come in here and do these instead of me. Um, but Rodney said, I've tried to work out how significant the tax and efficiency is for one of your favorite ETFs, MVW, the ASX, equal weighted. Presumably because it is equal weighted, rebalance, it must distribute some capital gains, even from the provider one of the webinars. When I asked the question, their answer appeared to downplay, ignore the concern. Okay, so this is a really good question. I've used an extreme example. Um, so I've used an extreme example by looking at this FANG ETF with 10 securities. And once again, I did it not only because I think it's stupid, but also because 
it's very easy to go through because of the lack of securities. Now, Rodney's talking about a equal weighted ETF. So let's talk about this for a second. So when we talk about a market cap weighted ETF, which I talked about before, as I said, one of the problems you run into there could be a problem, you know, maybe not, depending upon how things do, is of course, you are getting a big part of the ETF that go into the largest companies in it. To the extent where the difference between an ASX 200 ETF and an ASX 300 ETF is very, very small in terms of overall performance, because they're all both dominated, even though one has 100 more holdings, they're both dominated by those large holdings. Many people look at the Australian market, myself included, and say, well, we've got some problems with the market, that there's such an overallocation to my and banking, and such an underallocation to all the other sectors in these market cap weighted indexes, it's not a great outcome for investors. So I do like, as Rodney said, I do like that equal weighted index. So basically what that's looking at is that's saying we're going to put the same amount into every security into that ETF. So I agree with you, Rodney, that in that case, from a tax efficiency standpoint, and from the same thing that we're talking about from a distribution versus a dividend, you are going to have more problems. You're going to have problems because this thing is rebalanced in an up market that rebalancing will distribute capital gains. So I wouldn't necessarily use that ETF um, MVW as a income generating ETF, because I think you're going to have that same problem with distributions bouncing around. But I do think there are some benefits to getting more exposure, a wider exposure across different sectors. Um, but yeah, there's no doubt that that is less tax efficient than investing in an ASX 200 ETF. The problem, of course, is the potential problem is, do you want all that exposure to BHP? And particularly with many investors, the way they invest, I think one of the problems is they'll go out there and they'll buy some of these big securities. They'll own BHP outright. They will own some or potentially all the big four banks outright. And then, of course, they just buy an ETF saying, well, now I'm diversified. I own a couple of individual shares. I own an index. But all of a sudden, what they're basically doing is doubling up on all that stuff because it makes up so much of the ETF. So, yeah, Rodney, it is definitely more tax inefficient. Um, it's interesting that the provider couldn't answer the question because they know the difference between the dividend yield and the distribution. So one thing I would look at maybe if MVW is go in and look at the actual dividend yield versus what's quoted on something like Yahoo Finance and see what that difference is, because that difference is capital gains. And one of the things about capital gains is many investors like to time when they pay it, because you can, of course, do things like offset it with losses, things like that. You can't do that if it's in an ETF, or you could do that in your portfolio, making the simple decision to sell something on January or on uh, July 1st instead of June 30th can have different tax implications, right? Push those gains out into a future year. Um, so it's a good question. Um, so I have another question. Are non-thematic ETFs mainly best viewed as being for growth, not income investing, the variation distribution from year to year? So yeah, so that's what I'm kind of talking about. But we are going to talk about some factor ETFs, uh, including Morningstar's favorite dividend investing ETF. So we do have to look at what the goal is behind that portfolio construction. Um, so some ETFs try to go out there and capture high yielding, sustainable dividends. And if you are looking for income, that's probably a lot better of a choice um, because they're deliberately screening for those things. And while you still will have those distortions between distribution and dividend, so those distortions, but because they're pursuing a dividend strategy, you get higher overall income. Um, all right, so we've got a question from Mark. Uh, with a tightening market and diminishing shareholder returns, are ETFs still favorable compared to capital growth stocks, allowing for market risks that also pay a reasonable dividend percentage? Yeah, I mean, Mark, I think it depends, right? Like, and I'm not trying to skirt the question. Um, we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Right. We've obviously had a tough year, um, particularly if you're invested in U.S. stocks uh, in 2022. We've seen a bit of a rebound. Now we're getting a little bit of a pullback. We don't know what the future holds. Um, it depends kind of on the ETF and what you're investing in. So I think obviously ETFs 
do offer some benefits, the ability to diversify if you're not investing in this one, um, but the ability to diversify to single security, um, which is a big benefit. Um, and the ability, I think, to get exposure easily to a diversified portfolio based on a certain factor, like potentially income. Um, so there are some uh, there are some advantages. And Roddy said VHY, that is Morningstar's favorite income producing ETF, which we'll get to in a second. So good guess, Rodney. All right. To keep moving, I want to use one other example that really demonstrates kind of what happens with this yield chasing. And I am not picking on the equity mates, um, even though I took this post from their social media account, um, because they do say, but don't count on the same in 2023. So this just illustrates, once again, how some investors are going after income from ETFs and why they can have pitfalls. So they put in the five best dividend ETFs in 2022, and you can see the yield next to these things. These yields are not from dividends getting paid. So as the equity base pointed out at the bottom, which I think is really good, that these are very unlikely to repeat going forward. And the biggest example is this thing that has a 45% yield. I'll spend just two minutes on it because it is uh, rather funny, I guess, in a way. So this beta shares crude oil index ETF is an ETF that has one asset in it. It tracks oil futures. Now, the very interesting thing, if you look back, and maybe this is just because I'm to interested in this stuff. The one very interesting thing about this ETF, so it holds futures. So a futures contract is basically just a contract that um, denotes a price and an amount of oil that's delivered at some time in the future, right? So these things are used a lot as hedges. So if I'm an oil producer, I don't really know where oil is going to go. I can sell the oil I'm going to produce forward. So I'm basically locking in a price. So I can use it as a hedge. Conversely, if I'm an oil consumer, I'm a business that needs oil to do whatever I'm making, plastic, I don't know, whatever you, uh, whatever you do with oil other than put it in your car, um, I can lock in the price so I know exactly how much I'm paying for that oil that gets delivered to me in the future. They're not just used as hedges, though. They're also used for speculation by investors. So these are people that have no interest in actually accepting or delivering the oil. They don't want the oil. They want exposure to those futures. And so what has to happen then is, of course, because you don't want a bunch of oil to show up at your doorstop one day, you need to, of course, close out that contract. So what you do if you're this ETF is you sell that future contract as it gets very close to that delivery date, and then you buy another one forward. So you get another future that goes forward. And you continue to do this with the understanding that you have, of course, um, exposure to oil, exposure to oil futures, but you don't actually have to have it delivered at any time. So the interesting thing about futures is in general, the way that something like an oil future would work is that over time, what you'd see is you would see the future be worth more than the spot price. Spot price is if I want to buy oil today. That's the price of oil we see all the time. The future is generally worth more than the spot price. And the reason that it's worth more than the spot price is because these are used by real companies and there's a cost to store and transport oil, right? So if Emily orders 100 barrels of oil from me, I have to store that until she's ready to get it two months and I have to deliver it to her. And those both have costs and they're built into that future. So generally spot price, futures above it. But the oil market was crazy last year. It's so obviously the war in Ukraine. There is all sorts of stuff going around and demand and supply, right? We came out of COVID and demand went up and then OPEC cut supply. Russia, of course, has kind of been cut off. So all sorts of weird stuff was happening with oil. And for some reason, well, not for some reason, for all those reasons, the future was actually worth less than the spot. Now, the interesting thing is over time, those two prices come together. Right, Because if 
I have to deliver Emily oil in two months, and then all of a sudden it's a day before there, well, that knocks out those transfer, that storage cost, right? So they get closer and closer together until they actually match. So normally it's coming down, right? That future's coming down towards the spot and futures out in the future are higher for future delivery dates. Well, the opposite happened last year. So futures were actually lower than spot because there was so much uncertainty about oil supply. And so the very strange thing about this ETF is every time they rolled over a future, right? They sold one future, they bought another one. They were actually buying something that had appreciated in price, right? Or they're selling something that had appreciated in price as it got closer to the spot. It started out really low and it got closer to that spot price and they made a profit every time they sold that. So even though an oil future pays no dividends, you got a 45%, um, and it's not quite a 45% yield, but yeah, it has a 45% yield if we look at those distributions. Those are all capital gains. They're all coming from something that does not actually pay a dividend because it's a futures contract. The other thing that contributed to this high yield is that if you look at the price of this ETF, it had a terrible year. It's down close to 30% because over the year, oil prices actually fell, right? So just an example, and once again, an extreme example, but why you should not look at the yield when you are trying to go in there and produce an income investing strategy from a portfolio. All right, so let's talk about what you can do, and we'll get to some more questions after that. As Rodney guessed, what is our favorite income ETF? It is BHY, so the Vanguard Australian Shares High Yield ETF. So this is a factor ETF. And we won't go into all the details, but you can read about them, of course, on our website. If you'd like the article where analysts explain why this is their favorite ETF, send me an email. I'll send that to you. Um, but what these ETFs, what these four ETFs are doing, so within our coverage universe, there are four ETFs in Australia, domicile in Australia, that are trying to find high dividend um, paying shares. And this is our favorite one. It gets a bronze rating where the rest of these are all neutral. And the reason it got that, and one of the things we want to look out for, and think about if we're using an ETF to try to generate income, is we're trying to look for income that, number one, is sustainable, meaning that the shares within that ETF are not going to all of a sudden go and cut their dividends. We're trying to avoid something called a yield trap. We talked about a yield trap in terms of ETFs by just looking at the yield, but it's the same thing as shares, right? So going out there and buying the highest um, yielding shares can cause problems because potentially that yield is very high because the price has fallen and investors are worried about that company continuing to um, continue to pay out earnings. And Rodney, that is exactly the right point. Our analysts like this because we believe that the factor, once again, when you're building these factor-based ETFs, you're setting rules. So these rules govern which securities are selected that go into that ETF. In this case, they're looking for dividends. But what we really like about this is that the portfolio construction methodology, as we say here, is based on forecast yield. So it's looking forward, not backwards. And that's why we like it, because we feel like that has a better chance because they're actively looking into the future. It has a better chance of paying or of not investing into those yield tracks. So we do like that where when we go back and we look at some of these others, so IHD and SYI, that they're looking at dividend history um, instead of projecting forward. Um, and then of course, RDB is a little bit in between. The other reason, of course, that we like this is because it has a low fee. Now, remember that fee will be taken out of what you get as an investor. And so, of course, the lower the fee, even though these are pretty small differences, you can see the fee down there, even though these are pretty small differences, cheaper is better. So if we like the portfolio construction methodology and it has a lower fee, that makes our analysts happy. So I'm happy to send through that article of anyone 
anyone that wants it. All right. So let's talk about how you can use ETFs and some of the considerations you should go through as an investor. Then I'll get to some of those questions that have come out. Number one, of course, where we started this. Understand what you're trying to accomplish. Why are you investing in dividend paid shares within an ETF? Are you trying to, even if it's a future date, trying to create a predictable income stream? Are you trying to outperform the market? Are you trying to do both? But what are the implications of those decisions and why you're doing that? Having that firm understanding will then allow you, of course, as you're going into individual ETFs and trying to assess them, you can assess them against those criteria of what you're trying to accomplish. So as I said, focus on the yield of the underlying portfolio rather than the distribution history. And you'll get kind of funky ways that people describe these things using dividend and distribution interchangeably. Now, we all know what the difference is, but go look at that underlying portfolio. The way you can look at that underlying portfolio is you can go onto our website, so if you go on our website, you enter in an ETF, then you can go on. I'll show you where it is. How about that? Does that sound like a good idea? All right. That's me reading an article in the New York Times. Um, I'm on our website. So this is the uh, this is just morningstar.com.au. Um, so if I go in and look at We'll look at VHY uh, just because we've been talking about it. The same thing happens on Morningstar Investor as well. If the stupid ticker ever comes up, let's try to refresh this. I don't know when I was looking at this. Nope. There we go. Vanguard. So what you'll see on both Morningstar Investor and Morningstar.com.au is there is a tab for portfolio. So portfolio is something that is really important to look at for any ETF you buy because it's going and looking at that underlying portfolio. And what you can see is in these style measures, there's dividend yield. So this is the dividend yield. This is not the distribution yield. This is the dividend yield of what is actually held within this portfolio. And you can see in this case, it is quite high. Whereas I used that screenshot looking at that FANG ETF and it was quite low. And this once again is a lot better way to look at things in terms of predictability around where the future dividends where the future distributions might come from, even though there will be that capital gain component. As I said, going in and looking at that portfolio tab, understand the holdings. So there's underlying holdings in the ETF. What's in there? What rules govern what goes in there? You can read all of this information simply going to the ETF provider website. So go in there and they will talk about index construction if it's tracking an index. They'll talk about potentially manager strategy, if this is an actively managed fund, go in there and understand that. Look at rebalancing. See if this thing is rebalanced, when it's rebalanced, what the rules are around that. Remember, for broad-based ETFs, it will never be rebalanced because it doesn't need to be because it's tracking a market capitalization weighted index. So you may not see that word rebalancing in there. But understand that index and understand, yeah, when those rebalancing events will occur. And that, of course, can let you figure out what component of that distribution may be in capital gains and under what market conditions that may happen. Which generally, of course, is just when markets are appreciating. But even if the overall market isn't appreciating, they're still selling the winners. And that could be relative, right? It could be uh, companies that lost less money than others but just think about what those implications might be. The other thing to understand is that if you're using a lot of ETFs in your portfolio, and this is almost all ETFs to a certain degree, now those broad-based indexes will be lower, uh, but understand that there's naturally going to be some volatility in those distributions year to year because of those capital gains, no matter what the rules are. That volatility can be more or less, but think about how that could impact your plan. And there's a couple of different ways that you can 
counteract this impact of volatility. So one, of course, is you can have a cash buffer. So someone actually wrote me in after I wrote that income investing article and was talking about how he keeps a year of cash on hand. Um, and even though he was investing in individual shares, those dividends can go up and down. He kept a year of cash in hand to cover his expenses so that he could deal with any volatility that occurred. So that is one way that you can actually do that. The other way you can do, do that, of course, if there's more flexibility in your budget. Um, so either if you're being very conservative and you're setting a budget below what you think you're going to get based on history and based on your analysis of how big of an impact there can be, but also just people that are able to flex their spending more. All right. And so for some people, they can do that. So, you know, for some people, spending less next year than this year means maybe you don't take a trip. For some people, they're very much against that budget and maybe you don't eat, right? So depending upon your financial situation and where you are, see if you can build some flexibility into your budget and just look at your budget and look at what you're using this income for and think about how much um, changes in that income level are going to, uh, are going to impact you. Uh, so remember that obviously this can happen with shares. If you're going in there with individual shares, we saw this during COVID where we saw a lot of companies suspend their dividends. If you go over to the UK, you actually saw the central bank in the UK going and telling UK banks that they were not allowed to pay dividends. So you can see this also in individual shares. But depending upon how people structure your portfolio, if you think you're diversified because you're going into a couple ETFs, well, that impact, that volatility can be much more than if you have a very well diversified portfolio and short of another COVID happening, a couple companies cut their dividends, hopefully a couple companies raise their dividends. So just be careful of ETFs because remember, you're looking at an overall payment coming out. All right, so we're gonna answer some questions now. I lost my questions. There we go. Uh, let's see what we have. Lots of people are saying hi to everyone, which is very nice. Um, yeah, so Linda says with ETFs, can a capital loss made in one distribution time be counted against a capital loss in the following years? Yeah, the only, we're, we're not really focusing, I guess what I would say is we're not really focusing this on tax. So of course, yes, a, a capital loss does have a benefit for you, but I was trying to focus more on actual income and if you're trying to live off of that income stream. Now, obviously, the taxes that you pay are part of this, um, but once again, you could get that volatility, right, um, depending upon your losses and gains and everything else. Chances are, over time, what you're going to get is you're going to get more capital gains and capital losses. Now, hopefully... That is a good thing, right? Because over time, the market generally goes up. So most years, the market goes up if we look historically. So you're gonna have more of a problems with those capital gains being distributed. But of course, yes, they are, uh, they are credits. Um, <laughs> Lisa says, I'd like to think of my basket of individual stocks as my own ETF and the ticker would be Alpaca which I, I do like, at least of course, owns alpacas, um, which can be another source of income because you can sell their fur, wool, or whatever they produce. Well, we decided this at some point, right? Emily's looking at me like I'm a, uh, a lunatic. Okay, so we've got a question. Are there ETFs suitable for income investing? Yes, the ones I went through um, that are particularly just focused on uh, focused on dividends. Um, once again, read about the selection criteria, kind of think about those implications. But um, yeah, those are obviously focused on uh, focused on income. I think one of the problems that people run into with ETFs, we've got these broad-based ETFs. By definition, a broad-based ETF is not going to give you a yield that's higher than the market because it represents the market. Um, so if you're looking to get the average income from the market, that's a good opportunity. Um, but then when we get in some of these thematics and factory ETFs and all these sort of specialized things, that crazy oil futures ETF, that's when people run into trouble by sort of chasing that yield um, from the past. Um, 
got a question about VLC, which honestly, I will say, I don't know off the top of my head, but I will look that up. Um, okay, so VLC is Vanguard Miski Australian Large. Um, okay, so the VLC is simply looking at a large index. Um, so VLC is not a specific dividend related ETF where VHY is. Um, so hopefully that answers your question, but you stumped me. Large companies, there we go. As I said, Rodney should be doing these for me, um, but you did stump me on that ticker. So that's a good one. Look at that. Unlike the other weeks, we have finished four minutes early. Um, so Linda says, good question. Uh, VHY is focused on Australian shares. Morningstar have favorite overseas ETFs. Um, send me an email, Linda, and I will find out. Off the top of my head, I was just looking at domestic shares for this one because that's the comparison we did um, where we just – we already find BHY, um, but yeah, send me an email and I will, uh, I'll get you some information on that. Cool. Anyway, thank you guys very much for joining. Really appreciate it. Um, Emily has to have a meeting with me for an hour now, so she is very upset, but uh, I hope everybody up oh, the table again. So I'm going to put up the table because we had a request. All right, so the ones we looked at are, you can see the ticker right there. So BHY, the one we said was our favorite. We have SYI, RDV, and IHD. It's like an eye test. Um, so those are, the, uh, those are the four we were looking at. So hopefully that answered your question. Um, Oh, my email. Uh, yes. So my email is mark.lamonica1 at morningstar.com. So it is actually in the invite. So you should see that in the invite that gets sent out. And uh, yeah, feel free to send me an email. All right. Thank you guys very much for joining. Any advice in this video is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situation or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.